Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. So as many as you, of you know, and you've heard me talk about this a million times, it's super, super important to find your weight loss code. Now, part of that, which I've just discussed in the past, is really trying to find the foods that work for you and the diet that works for you. And there is no one perfect diet. But most women, they think, oh yeah, you know, Karen, I'm, I'm eating healthy. I eat a really clean diet and yet I still can't lose weight. Well, today we're going to talk about the really, you know, what is toted as healthy foods that could still be stopping you from losing weight because you have an intolerance to them. And this is very different than a food allergen and we're gonna get into this. My guest today is the absolute expert on this and I read her book a very long time ago. I think it was published in 2008, but I, I read it and it was the first time that I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is so amazing. It was a long time ago, but it was still so relevant. And it's one of these diet books that really has not gone out of style. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't gone on its way. It's still very relevant and very true. And I still use this woman's work all the time to help my clients to find their weight loss code. So my guest today is JJ Virgin. She is a triple board certified nutrition expert and fitness hall of famer. JJ Virgin is a passionate advocate of eating and exercising smarter. JJ and her team help people stay fired up and healthy as they age, so they feel the best they ever have at age 40 and beyond. JJ is a prominent TV and media personality whose previous features include co-host of TLC's Freaky Eaters, two years as the on-camera nutritionist for weight loss challenges on Dr. Phil, and numerous appearances on PBS, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, Access Hollywood, and The Today Show. So just a few places. JJ is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Virgin Diet, which we're talking about today, The Virgin Diet Cookbook, JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet, and JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet Cookbook. Her latest book, Warrior Mom, Seven Secrets to Bold, Brave Resilience. JJ hosts the popular Reignite Wellness Pod Night podcast, and you can find JJ at jjvirgin.com. So welcome, JJ. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. Well, I love your philosophy. We're right on the same page um, that you really have to go through the process and figure out your weight loss code mm -hmm. and then keep refining it because we are not you know, constant beings, everything's always changing. Yeah. I say that you're going to fight, you could find your weight, weight loss code today, <laughs> but then in a couple <laughs> months that may completely change as your hormones yeah. change or as your stress levels change, you can, you always have to adapt. Mm -hmm. Correct. So I love your book, JJ, because for those of you that are watching the video, I've got it right here, the JJ Virgin Diet. It was 2012. 2012, okay. I, do, I looked at it this morning thinking, how long ago was this published? So 2012, so eight years ago. So that, maybe that's where I got the 2008 from, was the eight was in my head. Still so relevant, isn't it? Isn't it crazy? It's, actually it's more than ever. Today, and I, when I first started talking about it, people were like, thought I was, possibly a little crazy. Um, but I remember the biggest challenge then, Karen, was people were confused about an allergy versus an intolerance. Yep. And, you know, that was when I was trying to figure out what the book was going to be, and we're trying to name it. Um, the publisher's like, well, we'll just call it a food allergy. I go, it's not a food allergy. <laughs> you know, that's where we, we were trying to debate between intolerance or sensitivity because they could be used interchangeably but I felt like intolerance people would get that more and I love what you said because it's true you know you could be eating foods every single day trying to be healthy thinking that they're so good for you because they're you know good quality foods maybe they're paleo or vegan or whatever and they're actually hurting you and that was really the big message that we that the book was about was that you could be eating these healthy foods every day trying to be healthy and they're actually hurting you and that you really have to go through your own process to figure out if you're intolerant to a food, to figure out which yeah. foods work for you and which foods don't. How did you figure it out like back then? Because a lot of people, we weren't talking about it, right? We weren't really talking about it. <laughs> they weren't. Um, what happened was very fortuitous. So I started out my career early, early on as a personal trainer. It was before there were personal trainers. We didn't even have a name back then. 
And it was me and Body by Jake and Mark Sisson, uh, Mark's Daily Apple, um, way back when. Yeah. And one of the things that happened, I was in grad school getting my graduate degree in biomechanics. And what became super clear to me back then, because we were taught that your body was a bank account. If you wanted to lose weight, you need to eat less, exercise more, and create a $500, 500 calorie deficit each day. And first of all, the first thing I figured out is that you could not out exercise a crappy diet that, you know, people would come to me and go, I want to lose weight. I don't want to change my diet. You know, just tell me what I need to do exercise wise. And that should have been my first clue that this whole idea of creating this deficit didn't work because if it was the bank account model, you could have just over exercised to burn off the extra calories, but it never worked. So I realized you couldn't out exercise a poor diet. And I started to really study, I, when I got to doctoral school, I started to study nutrition in the exercise physiology department. I realized it's all about nutrition. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that started to happen was I was working with a company teaching doctors how to put supplements in their practice. And I created a course for a, for a um, chiropractic college that I ended up taking as a workshop all over the country called Overcoming Weight Loss Resistance. And it all really started because I was on Dr. Phil and he had a chapter in his book called Weight Loss Resistance. And so I created a course around this, but in his book, there was only one thing that created weight loss resistance and that was insulin. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been working with another doctor in California, Dr. Diana Schwartzbein, and she taught that cortisol and insulin, that you had to get healthy to lose weight. <clears throat> it was really all about cortisol and insulin. So I created this course and I went, I think it's more than that. So it was cortisol and insulin and um, gut problems and sex hormone imbalances and thyroid and sleep issues and genetics. So I created this course and one of the things I started to do was help doctors put testing into their practice. And one of the tests that I used was a food sensitivity test. And so I was looking at lots of tests and what I saw was that the same foods kept showing up and that we were looking at gluten a different way um, but gluten, as we now know, can cause food sensitivities because it can make your gut leakier. But about 40% of people that we looked at in a gluten intolerance test had gluten intolerance. And so you have the small amount of people who have celiac, then you have over gluten intolerance, and then there's gluten sensitivity. So there was gluten issues. And then there was on this other test, it was like everyone I, I tested seemed to be reacting to eggs or dairy or both. And then the next year was um, corn and peanuts and soy. And so I started to look at this and I went, why are we doing these food elimination diets? They're pulling out all the stuff that I never see people reacting to, like citrus and strawberries were total outliers and shellfish, but yet those are what's always in those food elimination diets mm -hmm. and they're very complicated. And I go, and so what happened was people would come in to take the test and then they'd go away and three weeks later, the test result would come in. Well, I had nothing to do, you know, during the three weeks I was helping them eat healthier. And I thought, you know, I'll just start pulling out those foods during the time because, you know, most likely it'll be one or two of those, maybe all of them. So I pull out the gluten, the dairy, the eggs, the corn, the soy, the peanuts. They'd come back three weeks later, they'd feel great. And inevitably, a couple of those foods would show up on the test. It was rare that there wasn't any. Usually it was all or five or, you know, five of them. And so then we would go back and start challenging, heal their gut and then start challenging them. Well, over time, I realized that I didn't really need to do the actual lab test because I was getting the same or better results by pulling these foods out, having them do a reset and then coming back and challenging it. The one thing that had happened though was as I started to do this without using the test and we did it online and we're doing it now with thousands of people, um, I discovered that if I didn't pull sugar out, first of all, sugar was making the gut microbiome worse and making the gut leaky. But also if I didn't pull sugar out, people would default over to eating more sugar. Mm, <laughs> right? <nice. laughs> and I was like, oh. All right, we got to pull the sugar out too. So, because if you really look at what's making your gut leaky so that you have more food intolerances, fructose is a main player. And then 
uh, artificial sweeteners disrupt the gut microbiome, and then gluten and stress and pain medications. Those are the biggies. And so I had to make sure those things were out in order to not be making the problem worse. So that's how it all happened. Wow. I wish I could say, you know, what would happen was people would come in for their test. I'd put them on the diet while they were waiting for their results. They'd come back, they'd get amazing results without even knowing the test results. And they'd come in because they were bloated or tired or the skin was breaking out or they had joint pain, headaches, autoimmune problems. And all of a sudden, three weeks later, they're like, I don't want to ever eat that stuff again. <laughs> like, I feel so, so true. Bad, right. And back then, I was saying, okay, we'll swap your regular milk for coconut milk. Well, it, back then, trying to find coconut milk so was hard. like, I'd go to the Asian market and find the yeah. Asian <laughs> Oh my gosh. And then I was like, swap your pasta, wheat pasta for rice pasta. I mean, there was no other choices there. Swap your, your white tortilla for, you know, rice tortilla. There wasn't cassava. I mean, the, the, now it's super easy. Like, like I just made this weekend, we, we had um, this amazing pie that Dave Asprey's son gave me the pie crust recipe created for us with, a cheesecake top. <clears throat> it was all gluten-free, dairy-free, right? And then we had manicotti. It was all almond. <laughs> you know, it's like so it's amazing what you can do now that you couldn't do yes. eight years ago, right? Yeah, and clearly there's a market for it, or we would not see all of these substitutions. So it just clearly shows look at how many people have food sensitivities, right? Now, it, can you explain the difference be between the food sensitivity versus a food allergen? Because I think a lot of people will, I hear this all the time oh, I've had allergy testing. I'm, yeah. I'm not allergic to gluten. And it's a totally different situation. So, an allergy is looking at an IgE response. So it's a type of antibody or immunoglobulin that your body will immediately like react to the thing. So they open the peanuts on the plane, the person's throat closes up versus a delayed response is something that you probably don't even notice. And you'll hear people say this all the time. Oh, oh, you know, I don't, I don't have any of those. That's yeah. something I eat all the time. It's fine. It's the things you eat all the time that if I said to you, we're just going to pull that out for a week and you're like, oh, no, no. Uh, you can't take away my cheese. You know, yeah. those are the foods that people are most likely intolerant to, because what happens when you have a food intolerance is your body actually creates antibodies to that, and then you're prepared for when it's coming out. And usually, it's the food you're eating on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be a big amount. For me, I was putting the littlest bit of foamed up steamed milk into my coffee every morning. That was creating this. I mean, I, I dropped five pounds of my skin cleared up when I pulled that little bit of dairy from my coffee every morning out. And that's why we've got to get out of this idea that our, you know, our body is a bank account. It's not, it's a chemistry lab. And, you know, we react to things. It can create inflammation. It can raise stress hormones. It can create insulin resistance. And that will make your body better at storing fat rather than burning it. And so that's the big difference. And the IgE response, most likely you'll know because you have immediate reactions to it. I remember in college, I drank Midori uh, this, I had this melon ball drink, this Midori liquor. Oh, lot. yes. I remember that. I yep. Midori. I like, it's the one and only time I've yep. ever had it. Cause I broke out in a complete hives all down my body from Midori. <laughs> I was like, ew, you know, <laughs> wasn't good anyway, but no, was, like, yeah, gross. And it's bright green. Um, so you'll know generally when you have that, whereas delayed, they're low grade. They're things we've been trained to think are normal for us. So again, you might have something for breakfast and then you're bloated a couple hours later. You might have a, something for lunch and break out the next day. Your joints may ache. You have a headache. You're fatigued. Your skin is, is problematic. And you don't go, you know, oh, that must be, that must be from what I ate yesterday. We, we don't connect the dots no. from it. And it's so important for us to get to the point where we're really connecting, connecting the dots between what we're eating and how we feel and what we weigh. In fact, I had someone, I remember that's a big part of the virgin diet is doing that connection as you're rechallenging foods. And someone said to me, well, you know, I rechallenged gluten. I don't think I have any issues with it, um, except that I gained a couple pounds. I'm like, you have issues with it. Yeah. And <laughs> case in point, my, we had uh, last night for dinner, we had a bunch of Mediterranean food. Well, we had this gluten thing and um, I have a son who cannot eat gluten at all. 
and he had he had one of these like I forget what it was it was kind of like a it was this big puffy Turkish thing and I'm like I wasn't there and then I come sit down I'm like he's halfway through this thing and I'm like honey <laughs> <You know? laughs> honey we are like really and this morning he was up five pounds five pounds wow and I said it yes. was gluten sweetheart you'll be back down in another two days but that's an inflammatory response from gluten that's you know your body you're not getting five pounds overnight yeah yeah that's it happened to me with the dairy and this was years ago when I switched to a paleo based diet and I got down to just putting cream in my coffee every morning and so I really and I well oh, I felt fine and I remember my sister going maybe you should just cut dairy out and see if it helps with weight loss and Sure enough, I'm like, okay, well, I'll cut it out, but I really doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> and like within a week, like you, I lost five pounds. I was like, oh, and you're like damn Please it. Don't Please don't be true. Please don't be true. <laughs> don't be true. Because I felt nothing else. And still to this day, I feel nothing else. Like I, I don't feel anything, any sort of side effect from it. And yet I go, I'll, I will, if I continually put it in my diet, the weight goes up. If I have it occasionally, not bad. Gluten, yeah. on the other hand, same thing. I... <laughs> I'll go up. Yesterday I made with this extra time on my hands. In, when we're filming this, we're in the middle of our COVID-19 quarantine. So I'm sure we still will be when this comes out. But I thought, okay, I'm going to attempt making sourdough bread. Now I don't bake because then I eat it, right? That's, it's not a good <laughs> idea. So I haven't had like baked, I've never baked bread and I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to try it. I'll give it to my kids and husband. So it comes out of the oven. I mean, how do you not oh, have on. a piece oh, of like mean. That's warm ridiculous. baked bread? It was just like, so I take, I, I honestly had like this little tiny slice, had it with some butter on it. It was absolutely delicious. And then, and then I let it go. I was like, okay, that's enough. It felt okay. Actually, I thought I'd feel sick. Woke up this morning, my eyes, I was like, I'm looking in the mirror. I'm like, what did I eat a lot of salt yesterday? I'm thinking about what I had for dinner, and I'm like, no, what did I? It didn't, then it dawns on me like it was the freaking gluten. Like my, my yep. eyes looked like yeah. I had partied all night long. <laughs> yeah, and this is what happens. Like it can be, mm -hmm. it can be dramatic, but your body does get. It, it's weird if you're eating it all the time. You do yeah. feel like mm -hmm. you're fine. Like you don't put the two together until right. it's out. Yeah, when it's out, you'll really notice because the antibodies go away, your immune complexes go away, and then all of a sudden you got no protection and you eat it and your body goes, bam, right? And so people will go, but wait, I don't want that to happen because I want to be able to eat it. I go, well, it's the choice of either feeling bad when you eat it and knowing what it's doing to you or feeling low grade bad all the time and just pretending you don't really feel bad when you do. Like, it's hurting you if you're eating it and you're having those responses. And, you know, I actually think that the only time I really use food sensitivity testing anymore is if we've pulled all the foods out, done this detox, reset, and then we go back and test and you're still not really where you want to be. That's when I'd start to look at a stool test, look at your gut microbiome, look at food sensitivities there. But for the majority of people, that alone just fixes it. And I think it's really important when you talk about your weight loss code to go through and say, all right, step one really has to be, to me, the step one of your diet is clean it up. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone's worried about like, you, you know, what not to eat. I'm like, why don't we first focus on adding before we take away, like yeah. starting to eat more non-starchy vegetables, get more fiber in, um, make an oil change to healthier fats, drink more water in between meals, drink green tea. I've got some right here. Why don't we first start with that, then figure out your food intolerances. Mm -hmm. Once you've figured that out and you've really figured out how to fix your plate correctly so you stabilize your blood sugar, then we can lower your sugar impact, make sure sugar's not seeking in. Then we can start to look at the clock and shorten your feeding window and get rid of the snacks. You know, So it's just a process where you're always looking at what can you improve. I mean, in and I'll tell you, since um, I'm never home, I travel 70% of the time, I was like, ooh, this is awesome. Now that I'm home, 
I can really maximize my ability to intermittent fast. I can do double yeah. workouts. I can, you know, I can drink a lot more water because I've got a bathroom right close by, you know, yay. <laughs> yeah, no, I've taken advantage of it. Like I said, I made kombucha. I'm going to make mm -hmm. some kimchi next. <laughs> I'm like, yes, but no more sourdough. That's it for me. <laughs> yeah, I always say don't bring the, I, I literally, I, I made a, um, cheesecake but the cheesecakes i made actually could be for breakfast because they've got they're so perfect with you know they basically use almond ricotta and almond mm -hmm. uh, cream cheese and then i made a berry pie that again david asprey's son created this recipe it's amazing but all these things have no sugar in them but still you don't want to be like eating a truckload of fruit um and then we made this manicotti and then I got this, you know, did you see that Double Tree released their chocolate chip cookie recipe? No. Oh, they did. Oh. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to attempt this one. So, um, I did my first attempt and, uh, now I know what I need to do differently, but I mean, we're doing these all with like, you know, using monk fruit or allulose and using almond flour and dark chocolate chips with stevia and walnuts so i mean they're totally they're totally safe stuff but yeah. still too much healthy foods unhealthy like i've got cookie balls down there and i'm like all right we're not gonna yeah. become piggy and it's it's so easy to, to so easy you know i always look at and i go do not bring trigger foods into the house so no. whatever that is for you no mm -hmm. no and that's the thing is those substitute like those are that's such a great alternative and even in my meal plans, I always give somebody the, you know, paleo version of something sweet because I believe you should have a little of that something, mm -hmm. but it does trigger. It may not spike yeah. your blood glucose like the real stuff does, but it does trigger overeating because it's still, yeah. it's like, Ooh, this tastes yeah, good. Oh, it's stevia. Food. It's totally okay. And we start like pounding it back. <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> Triggers, too much healthy foods, unhealthy. <laughs> yes, yes. So when it, like I noticed, I, I used to work in a naturopathic office where they did a lot of the food sensitivity testing. And I did find, and I've read a lot more about it now, which is that it's not that accurate, that it's better to do an elimination with the foods. Would you agree? Well, there's so, I look at two different things there. Number one, um, you know, when you look at food sensitivity testing, you're looking at uh, hopefully an IgG4. Mm -hmm. There's different types of food sensitivity testing. I really only like that IgG4 test. I found that a lot of them have a lot of false positives. And so that's the one that I look at. Um, however, when I'm looking at food sensitivity testing, so food allergy testing is super duper specific to this IgE um, hormonal um, immune response. When I look at food sensitivity, I want to look at, is my immune system delaying a response? Is there some kind of hormonal response, right? Um, is there something genetic going on? There's a bunch of different ways we could become intolerant to a food. Some we may be born with, some we may develop, right? And some might be more that it's triggering some kind of hormonal situation. So I think we've got to consider all of that. And the IgG test is only looking at delayed uh, immune response to that test and again or to that food there are multiple tests out there and I know the one that I don't care for it's called an alcat I've seen that's the one that I see a ton of delayed responses to versus the one that's the IgG4 and there's one that has an IgG I think one in four that will show like um, you want one that's shown that's been around for a while which is the IgG4 not one that's like, oh, this is like a relatively new thing because it could be new and go, right? So we want to look at something that's been delayed. So that's what that IgG4 is. But again, I think for the majority of people, you never even need that. Yeah. You don't need it. You can do this yourself, which I love because I'd rather you take that money that you were going to spend on the test and spend it on supplements um, high quality food, you know, like mm -hmm. you don't need to spend it on the test. There's better places to spend it. I do love testing, but I don't think most people probably need a food sensitivity test. Um, and in fact, if you got a food sensitivity test, test and it showed a lot of um, issues, that's much more a sign that you need to clean up your gut because the reason you have all those food intolerances is because your gut is leaky and your gut is leaky because 
you need to look at your stress in your life. Um, you need to get the gluten and fructose out. You need to clean up your gut microbiome and not do artificial sweeteners. You need to look if you're using any kind of um, over-the-counter prescription drugs that make your gut leaky, like uh, a lot of the NSAIDs do. So that's the, the big step there. And so why not clean that up first and the problem may just go away anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's important too, because people can see like I, if someone saw my food sensitivity test, it didn't look like I had many intolerances at all. Egg weights were the worst Egg, eggs. I was like, Oh, I just feel totally fine once again. Um, but I could, t- could have taken that and been like, well, I've got no food sensitivities. I'm fine. I don't need to take this out of my diet. And then when I took out the gluten and I took out Mm -hmm. the grains and stuff like that, it, it, I felt so much better in every way, shape and form. So what it was doing to insulin and that's, that's why. So you're looking at test. it's going to look at, is your body creating antibodies to specific foods, which means you had to be eating the foods for that to happen. If you're not eating foods, one out. But it's not going to look at, oh, I eat this and I get a big blood sugar and insulin response from this. And, you know, it's not going to look at that. So that's a different response. So you might be doing like, there's certain foods, and this is what's interesting now with some of the gut microbiome testing, where they're looking at your blood sugar response to different foods based on what's going on with your gut microbiome. Like whole nother way to look at this thing. Yes. But I think for the most part, when we eat what I call higher sugar impact foods, foods that tend to create a bigger blood sugar or insulin response that have lower nutrient density and lower fiber, you know, we don't do as well. Now, what they're finding with gut microbiome is that some people like certain foods, like when they did my gut microbiome test, um, the foods that don't tend to do well for me in that place are foods that I don't like anyway, that like I never... That, like if you said to me, I have to eat an eggplant, I'm going to like, first of all, what an icky food. Like, Ugh. like that's just a icky, weird. I don't believe it. Is so, I can't believe people that. like it. Like what it, if you have to food and the only way that food is going to taste good is if you like soak the hell out of it in oil and fry, fry it. the crap out of it. Yeah. Yeah, then saute it and slather it with cheese and sauce. You know, it's wrench like, it in breadcrumbs, fry oh. it. <laughs> then it tastes good. Yeah, it's like going, but that could have been that could have been anything. I could have been my shoe. So I've never understood eggplant, but I don't do well with eggplant or peppers, and I don't like them. So it wasn't like a big a big bummer or tomatoes. It's funny, all the nightshades came mm-hmm. out for me with. Um, and with my microbiome testing, which it's never really, I've never noticed anything one way or the other when I pull them out or not. So I'm still kind of like, I don't know about this microbiome testing yet. I don't know. Yet. Is that the V, is it called Viome? Is that what the name is? I did two different ones. I did okay. a, I did Viome and then I did um, day two. Got to look at what the day two said. Um, but the biome one was like potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and then a couple weird random mm-hmm. things like figs. And I'm like, well, never eat those, you know. <laughs> it's still a- correct though on the nightshades. Yeah, but I mean, I've never noticed an issue. I just, they're just foods I don't tend to eat anyway. I don't like them. So, so maybe but, I don't but, like them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's something a little yeah. intuitive there. And that brings the next point of you have, I, I always start with like add food first then figure out your food intolerances. Once you've gone there, if that isn't enough, then you can start to look at say high histamine foods, nightshades, um, you know, so other foods that might be problematic for you and then sugar, you know, so you just keep going down the progression, but I still don't believe that there's any test that is superior to the test of how do you feel. Um, but you really need, in order to really gauge how you feel, you've got to give your body time to, to detox because you've got immune complexes built up that that's got to get rid of first before you can go back and rechallenge. So you've got to give yourself that time mm-hmm. to go through it and then really get clear, like, did my heart rate go up? Did I get bloated? Did I get tired? Did I get depressed? You know? Anxiety, people, it can be all just in the brain. 
doesn't he help you with this shortness of breath like you mm -hmm. know so which of course right now i was like i ate something that gave me shortness of breath and i was like oh my god i got, I got, I got coronavirus you know it's like right, no. right yeah no, no. It, it, you just you just ate manchego sheep cheese and it's like that's what did it right so, so the foods that are in the virgin diet that, that are you that you've seen are as being really high intolerant foods um let's just go through them so it was corn soy soy gluten uh, gluten and then um and gluten you know it's kind of interesting because it's like they're really more food categories because you look at gluten yeah. and gluten is in so many silly things like I, gluten is in pringles it's in first of all i shouldn't be having pringles anyway it can be put on like some of the steaks at restaurants will put will put uh wheat flour on the steak so there's so many places we use gluten and then cow's milk dairy. Now, I always have people pull out cat all dairy, and then once they've tried cow, they can go back and see how they do with sheep and goat. They may not do well with cow, but they might be able to handle sheep and goat. So we have to do one by one. Eggs, what I've seen with eggs is that, um, I was very intolerant to eggs for, and I healed my gut back. And I can do eggs now, I don't do them every day, but they need to be pastured. And so yeah. the other piece there is, it's not just you are what you eat, it's you are what you eat, ate. And probably a big reason we've developed these, these issues is with the processing of food, you know, we've got cows being fed soy, we've got chickens corn. being fed soy and yeah. corn. So corn and soy got, yeah, got into our diet way more than they should have. And then, um, you know, and, and soy, like when you look at how soy was used traditionally, um, it was used as a soil remineralizer. And then if they did eat it, they highly, highly fermented it. They didn't like just turn it into ice cream or a, a hot milk dog. and it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but soy, gluten, dairy, eggs, peanuts, and um, corn. And I think peanuts, the challenge too, is it just became one of those things that was everywhere, cheap. And, you know, my bigger issue with peanuts is really, it's one of the highest mold crops. And we're not really testing, yeah. you know, one of the biggest challenges with all of these issues with like the GMOs, which GMO, the big issue with GMOs, um, besides the genetic modification is the fact that those, those crops can now get a crap ton more um pesticides sprayed on them without dying which is problematic yeah um but no one's really testing going what happens when you put a bunch of soy and some gmos and you know um some some uh gmo corn all the stuff in the body and then what are what happens when it starts to store all this stuff which is the bigger question is like you got a whole bunch of crap and you know every time i go to europe and i just went like right as this whole thing was going on which is why i started doing massive immune support back early january because i was traveling to europe oh, wow. and the middle east and i went over to israel and what was so interesting was we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we had breakfast at like 7 a.m., and then we had lunch, and then we had dinner, and, you know, these were like massive meals every single day, and we were on a tour bus, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Like, first of all, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm eating like twice as much as I would normally eat in a day, and, you know, sitting on my butt, and not getting workouts in like I'm used to, and I came home and I didn't gain an ounce. I was going to say, <laughs> let me guess, you lost weight. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. like, every time I go to Europe, usually though, I'm, I'm in Europe, I'm eating like whatever I want to eat. And I'm walking like fiend. Here we were walking some, but not as much as normal. And, but it always strikes me as like one of the biggest challenges we have with our, it, it's we have a really toxic food supply. And oh, damn. I, when you're trying to do it well, like we're so careful at home. I'm like, you still yeah. get it. Yeah. It's, My mom travels all over the world. She says the same thing. She's like, every time I go to a different country, I can eat the bread. I can eat the dairy. Yeah. She's like, I come home and I think maybe it's gone. And she, no, it's just from our food supply. And she's even tried to mimic it and buy like, you know, the whole, the stone ground, whatever it is, fermented this or whatever. It, 
trying to mimic what she was eating over in Italy. And she said, it just doesn't work. She said, I don't know what it is. And it's like, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you yep. right now. That's what it is. <laughs> so we can just all move to Italy and then we'll be fine. Well, maybe not right now. No, but. yeah. Italy would be at the top of my move to list now. <laughs> it's not, no. <laughs> yeah. But when you do go there, try and eat bread. If you can't eat bread here, it's down the road. It can work. Yeah. Yes. So... I think, do you, do you feel like it needs to be out? All of these things need to be out for a certain amount of time. Like I always tell people three weeks because it, that's how long it kind of takes for the antibodies to really leave yeah. the system. Three weeks is the least amount of time. Yes. Um, I always have people start with the first week, weigh in every single day because they're losing, you know, inflammation's going down. So it's usually a pretty dramatic response. Um, check in with your symptoms by the end of that first week, but you've really got to give yourself three weeks to get everything cleared. By the end of the first week, you'll have established a new normal of what feeling good feels like. Um, what happens is I find that at the end of three weeks, people are like, oh, I never want to touch that stuff again. Yeah. And But you need to do it to see how you feel. So that's the important thing. Um, if during that time, that three week period, something gets in there, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I blew everything. All you need to do is give whatever you tested. Cause when you're testing back, it's really important to not go, cool, I'm going to test it all back. So what I'll do is I'll have a pizza, you yeah, know, right. <laughs> everything I just I'll took put out, we'll put some was. soy on it too yeah. while we're there. <laughs> yeah. So we don't do that. We don't go have popcorn, pizza, and sushi, and like, you know, but All in one day. what you can do is you test one at a time. So if something, if like somehow week three gluten snuck in somewhere, just wait that one, put that one at the end, and then just start testing them one by one. And what I do is I'll test one and I track so you start tracking all of your, you track your weight, you track all your symptoms. And at the point that you notice something, which might be in the first hour, it might be four days later and you felt nothing, but whenever you feel it, that's when you stop and then give yourself another three day washout before you do the first food, just the next food, just in case something shows up because you can have a symptom 72 hours later. Um, if you know, the minute you notice something, it's out, but if you notice an extreme thing in the first day or two, then this is a food you need to keep out for another three months, then re-challenge again. If you didn't notice something for three or four days and it was mild, then it's something that could rotate into your diet every three to four days because it takes that long for you to start to build up the immune complexes. So that's how you basically do it. I just truthfully, I find life easier to navigate. Like corn is pretty much a GMO food here. Popcorn for me is yeah. one of my biggest trigger foods. Like this whole idea that that whole eat, first of all, air pop cop popcorn is a nasty, icky thing. Um, but regular popcorn and trying to keep yourself from overeating it. Good luck on that. Impossible. So, impossible. impossible. I remember I finally had to take the bag of popcorn and go throw it in the trash, open it up and dump it into the trash outside. Cause I was like going popping it in coconut oil, then putting ghee on it and, and salt. And I'm like, I will eat the entire thing. So no, this isn't happening. So know your triggers. I find that to be a big one. Um, soy, you might find that you do fine with gluten-free soy sauce, a little bit of it, or you can just use coconut aminos. But the rest of that soy just has been shown to have way too many issues. Um, yeah health-wise for your thyroid, uh, estrogenic situations. And if you're trying to get isoflavones, there's plenty of other places you could do it. So it's always another easy one to keep out. That Very I don't easy. Keep gluten, even if you don't react to it, the challenge with gluten is that it can, uh, it's very insulinogenic, number one. So it's raising insulin, it's inflammatory, but also it does trigger the release of something called zonulin, which makes your gut leaky. So I don't really see the, the like gluten as something you should have in your diet anyway. Not uh, in North America. No, when I believe when I go to Europe, I'm like game on, but not, in, the not in here. Um, no. And then dairy, if you do not react to dairy, if you're getting grass fed, fermented cows, dairy, you know, that's one thing, but don't eat factory dairy. I can do little bits of Gouda goat and Manchego sheep, but little bits, that's it. Little, yeah. little bits. Um, and truthfully, I mean like, gosh, there's so many great options now with the nut cheeses. There is. 
incredible. And, um, and the milks, there's so, there's going to be a milk that you, you can tolerate, like yeah, almond and so coconut much. and cashew and. It's fantastic. And coconut with cream. I mean, it's like yeah. so good. And then uh, a peanuts, like they're not nuts. They're not nuts. So like eat nuts, you know, like mm-hmm. peanuts are a legume anyway. Um, mm-hmm. and when then, it, with the, the, anyone? Oh, I think that's right. Yeah. You got eggs. Them. I mean, to me, oh, eggs, eggs, yeah. eggs are such a great food. So the goal oh, is to feel your gut so that eggs are not bothering you. Don't be the person out there who thinks they're like doing great eating egg whites. That's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. You're blessed with a protein. You've got all the great stuff in the yolk. Just make sure that you're getting pastured eggs. Don't eat crappy eggs. Like we are what we eat. Eight. If you want to improve to me, eating a regular egg is eating junk food. You know, it's like eating, it's like eating a regular um burger that's got corn and fed corn and soy just or or uh factory um farm raised salmon like this yeah. food don't eat it no and it, and farm fresh eggs are so cheap i mean my neighbor sells them to me for four dollars a dozen it's well, like could you live out in nowhere yeah <laughs> but still you can still even at the farmer's market they're six dollars all right let's just call it what it is i get them for six bucks at whole yeah that's not that bad you know, yeah. all things that's, it's worth the extra two bucks well, that you're well, going to pay. I mean, that's, that's like 50 cents an egg. That's, that's a deal. That's a deal. Yes. And it's easy. And I think too, it's important to say when going gluten-free, a lot of people will just hit the gluten-free, like crazy products. Right. And I find that if you do have a, a gluten sensitivity, you are likely going to be sensitive to gluten-free as well, unfortunately. Well, there's also like, that's why I wrote Sugar Impact Diet after Virgin Diet is I went, all right, you know what? You weren't eating cupcakes before. Yeah. Do not start eating them now. Just because they're gluten-free. Like, like just because they're gluten-free doesn't mean they're okay. So we still need to watch the sugar impact. And the reason I say sugar impact is because you got to look at what impact something has either on your blood sugar or your insulin. And something might look like it's fine for your blood sugar, like agave, and it just kicks oh, up into high gear. So and bad. So you've got to look at these. So many of these gluten-free products, um, you know, they're just they're very insulinogenic, like a lot of the flours, etc. That's why I like I like mixing, doing a blend of say maybe a rice flour or a cassava flour with almond flour or coconut flour, so you can lower that sugar impact of some of those flowers. Yeah, because a lot of, it should be like gluten-free sugar full is what it should say on the packages, <laughs> right? <laughs> so JJ, you and I were talking before we got on here today about age, because I was telling JJ, she looks amazing. If you're on the podcast, check out the video. She's, I always like to highlight these women that practice what they preach and she's one of them she looks beautiful and we just figured out that we've got the same birthday oh, coming crazy. up in a week on april 19th <laughs> and i was like well she's probably close to my age no she's turning 57 so happy birthday jj um a very, a very non like non-impactful birthday it's like yeah, 57. Yeah. You're not 60. Yeah, same with 44. I'm 44. That's not impactful either. It's just yeah, it's like, no. oh, I'm just closer to 50. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the best birthday on the planet like, is 50. Yeah, I think so too. There's something I wish. It's too bad you can't mentally. 20 be, and 50. Yeah. 20, 50, and 100. 30 and 50. and But 50, like, you just kind of realize all this stuff you thought was important is it's not, not so important. remotely important. And, you know, there's 50 was just a fantastic birthday for me. Um, so yeah, that's it just, you'll be very happy about the 50 thing. In fact, I would just have your 50th birthday at 44 and then have yeah. it again at 45 and 46. I might just have my 50th birthday again. You should. <laughs> yeah. Um, that great of a birthday. So <laughs> yeah, I said to my husband the other day, I'm like, cause he, his birthday is coming out too. And I'm like, like, I don't, it, it's really hard to, to manage the what's changing. You know, my body's changing, my skin's changing, all of the good, more gray hair. I said, those things are, you know, you, we have to work on accepting them. I said, but I love aging because every year I just become so much more wise. And I'm, I'm all those things that I thought mattered don't matter anymore. And like your values completely change. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. what I, I, what I was going to ask you about that because you're fit, turning 57 is you've been in, in the industry for a long time, as have I. What has held true all of these years when it comes to helping, like what does it take to lose weight? Because it's, you know, there's so much noise out there. And the food intolerance is a huge piece of it. But is there something that just holds, or a couple of things that just hold true for you as far as advice to a woman that's trying to lose weight that is 40, over 40? Yeah, because boy, the rules change. Yeah. But one thing is constant that never changes. And um, it was very interesting. This came up in my community. I did a query. It's like, if you're not where you want to be with your health and your weight, why not? And I thought it would be like cheese or gluten or sugar or blah, blah, blah. Right. And the common comment was, I don't feel worthy enough. I don't feel good enough. So I will tell you that the single most important thing that you need to do to be successful in your health and your weight is to come from a place of self-love, not self-loathing, and to get really clear on why this is important for you, not for anybody else. It might be because you wanna show up how you wanna show up for your family, how you wanna show up in your career, but ultimately it's how you wanna show up for yourself. Because if you're coming from a place of, of self-hate and desperation, and it, it will fail every single time. If you come from a place of what do I need to, how can I take better care of myself for me? How can I feel my best? You know, um, then you'll just keep going down this long, because it's a long game here. Because mm -hmm. all along the way, if you're 40 plus right now, there are going to be things that start to happen. You'll go, what the hell just happened here? Is there an enemy? Like, like who got in my body with me, right? And so, but if you come from a place of, of I'm doing this because I want to be able to show up as my best self, I want to feel the best about myself, and I understand all along the way things are going to be curveballs, weird stuff, et cetera. Like, I will tell you that the minute this whole coronavirus hit, I felt like I was back in the hospital with my son. Um, it was that level of like, ah! you know, and I, I literally, my weight went up five pounds overnight and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I changed nothing, nothing, but it was purely a stress response and that will happen. And I was like, all right, this is going to, this, it's all going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to breathe. This will go back to normal. And, you know, and I'm in this for the long game. And what do I need to do to take care of myself best right now so that I can be where, who I need to be to be able to help my communities, you know, both, both my consumer one and my mindshare one, take care of my family and my doggy and all that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love it. I, I completely right agree. There. Look at this. My dog got a, got a, man, a little manicure. Oh, <laughs> This is what happens when I am um, my daughter, my stepdaughter's a little bored right now. So she has a little pink toesy. <laughs> and even now is going to want to see this and not just listen to it. To see this. So cute. I wish I had my chihuahua so I could show you her. Oh. Aw. <laughs> a little wait during this time though, because everybody's home and she thinks she needs a treat. Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, thank you, JJ. I think that's great advice. I couldn't agree more. I think instead of looking for the next best diet, instead work on self-love and working on yourself and the rest comes a heck of a lot easier when yeah. you do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure and happy birthday. Yes, you too.